Maybe we could start. I want to thank you all for coming to our 11th lecture of a series of radio astronomy talks that we've been having since early last year. Uh, this series was initially supported by George Halburn, um, a friend of our department, and, and then the late Jim, George Halburn. And then this year, uh, his family continued the support of the, uh, the series. So we'll have three lectures uh, this year, one per each quarter. And uh, today is the fall quarter um, lecture. Um, <clears throat> so we are uh, really, um, we, we wouldn't have this series of lectures without late George Howard. And I thought that the, the family also supported this. It's just tremendous that we actually have a friend of our department and this is really, this series is dedicated to the memory of George Halburn for all the things that he's done for us. And his uh, family basically continued the support of this, uh, this series. So we really appreciate that. I also like to thank our chair who provided additional funds to videotape this series. So we'll have uh, videotapes of this series, these lectures this year. We, um, we have audio tapes of all the lectures that we had last year on our website. So if you're really interested to have a look and listen to some of the old uh, lectures, you, uh, you're welcome. You can, you can listen to them. Uh, today, we are pleased to welcome our distinguished speaker, Mark Reed, from uh, the Center for Astrophysics. Mark is very well known in the community um, of uh, radio astronomers and astronomers. He uh, got his degree uh, from Caltech in 1975, and then he went to uh, the CFA as a fellow for a couple of years. Then he moved to Charlottesville as a staff member at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And then uh, he decided that he likes Boston, and he's actually his wife liked him, to go back to Boston. So he, uh, he joined uh, the Center for Astrophysics um, in late 70s, and he's been there for uh, since then. It's, um, Mark has uh, really been known as a world leader in the development of the VLDI technique. He is widely recognized as the father of ultra high precision VLDI astrometry and its application. He's going to tell us a little bit about that. He has had numerous scientific and technical um, contribution, perhaps the greatest uh, contribution that he's made, at least to many of us who work on the galactic center, is that we measure the distance to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The most accurate measure of the distance to the center of the galaxy was done by, uh, by Mark and his collaborators. He also measured uh, accurate position of uh, the uh, uh, radio source at the center of our galaxy and also the proper motion on the sky. And that really established the uh, the uh, supermassive black hole, the existence of the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. Um, he uh, also uh, recently has been involved in accurate uh, uh, measurements of uh, uh, stars in the galaxy and his understanding of the, the, uh, the structure of our galaxy, the sort of the three dimensional structure of our galaxy by measuring these uh, sources. Uh, with his uh, with the VLBI, uh, very accurate measures, and, and of course he found that the uh, that the distances were wrong, and the rotation velocity and also the mass of the galaxy is actually redefined by his uh, measurements. And uh, and lastly, Reed uh, uh, Mark Reed has also played a key role in the first direct measurements of proper motions of the local group of galaxies. It's a technique that has the potential to revolutionize our understanding of the mass distribution within the local group and the dark matter. He uh, received numerous awards. Uh, just I mentioned a couple of them. He uh, received a senior award from the Alexander von Humboldt Society and the Beatrice uh, Tinsley Prize for outstanding career contributions <coughs> from the American uh, Astronomical Society. So with that, I, uh, um, I'd like to give the floor to him. He's going to talk about the telescope, the size of the Earth. And uh, lastly, we'll have uh, pizza at the end of the hour. So please stay around. Okay, Thank you, Farad. 
Okay. So I'm basically going to cover in some level of detail, not that much, almost everything I've already mentioned in the introduction. So basically it's about very long baseline interferometry in the radio where you can get angular resolution uh, equivalent to the size of a telescope that spans the Earth and what you can do with that. There are going to be sort of several sections of this talk. First I'll just describe a little bit about radio wavelengths and then I'll go into three topics which is really the structure of the Milky Way, uh, what's happening in the galactic center. I gather you've heard some talks by Andrea Getz a, a couple of weeks ago. I'll give you the other side of that, the radio side of that picture. And then if I have any time left, I'll go into the extragalactic uh, uh, applications of, of, pro of astrometry. Okay, so just to orient you, this is a Green Bank telescope. It's a 100 meter diameter telescope. Uh, it's uh, probably the best general radio telescope in the world. Um, angular resolution of that telescope, uh, wavelength divided by the size of the dish, is something like about an arc minute at centimeter wavelength. So it's about comparable to the human eye's resolution. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, it's nowhere near the resolution you can get with an optical telescope. And if you have a 10 meter optical telescope with adaptive optics, uh, you can get an angular resolution of about 40 milli arc seconds. Okay. In fact, back in the early days of radio astronomy, it was thought that there was no hope of getting uh, radio images that anywhere rivaled the resolution of an optical telescope. Of course, the development of radio interferometry, uh, and that's Martin Ryle got the Nobel Prize for it, basically, uh, changed that totally. Now, you've had a talk last year from Jim Condon on radio interferometry, so I'm not going to give you more than a, a sketch or two here. So here's a, a schematic diagram of a radio interferometer. Uh, so you have two radio telescopes, one here and one here. They're looking at a source. The waves are coming in this direction. We call this the interferometer baseline. Uh, there's a delay in the signal reaching this telescope relative to this one. The signals are usually uh, come in at radio frequencies, they're amplified, then they're mixed down to baseband where they're more easily handled. That's going on over here. Then they're cross multiplied and integrated and then you do something with that signal. A radio interferometer, just like any interferometer, measures a Fourier component of the sky brightness. And so if you accumulate enough Fourier components, you can do a Fourier transform and get an image of the sky. Okay, so here's a picture of the very long, ba the, sorry, the very large array in New Mexico. This is sort of the world's premier radio interferometer. It's kind of uh, a neat place. This is in New Mexico. It's in the plains of St. Augustine, and you can see it's pretty flat. It's flat for, for about 35 kilometers or more, and it's at an elevation of 7,000 feet. So, for example, it's that's higher than Kitt Peak National Observatory, where the optical telescopes are up on top of the mountains. Uh, there are 27 telescopes, each 25 meters in diameter. Here they're pictured in a very compact configuration, but they can be moved along railroad tracks down there about 20 kilometers in each direction. There are three arms. <clears throat> so with a baseline now of 35 kilometers, you can get at one centimeter wavelength, you can get an angular resolution of about 60 milli arc seconds. So now you're comparable to the best optical telescopes in the world, including Hubble. Okay. So, um, can we do better than this? And that's, of course, what this talk is about in terms of angular resolution. And yes, we can by a technique called very long baseline interferometry. And this is sort of a schematic of the very long baseline array. Uh, that is run by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. Actually, well, I won't go into the politics of that right now. <laughs> um, it has 10 antennas, each 25 meters, so the antennas are comparable to the VLA antennas you just saw, except they're spread across the Earth from Hawaii, which is not accurately pictured here, it'd be around a bit, to St. Croix in the Virgin Islands, to New Hampshire, um, and a lot of them in the southwest United States. And so you can get 8,000 kilometer baselines with this array. So what do you do with the data from this array? 
Okay, I'll go back to our picture of a uh, basic schematic of a radio interferometer. And now we'll change this area here. Okay, I've just put in black boxes, but what's going on in there is that uh, you have independent frequency standards at the two telescopes. Obviously, you can't have the same frequency standard transmit a, uh, a local oscillator signal uh, across the Earth very easily. Okay, and, and uh, you record the data on, you used to record it on magnetic tape, now on computer disk. And then you ship the tapes or disks to a central correlation facility, and you do the cross-correlation there. And then the analysis after that is fairly similar to any conventional interferometer. Um, the frequency standards that are used at each site are hydrogen masers. And these are better than cesium standards, for example, at short, short time scales of hours and minutes which is most important for these interferometers, to maintain coherence between the two elements in the interferometer uh, while you make a measurement. They're good to about a part in 10 to the 15th over time scales of, of 20 minutes, 30 minutes, which is what we care about. Um, and they're used for two things. They're used both to generate a local oscillator signal to mix from radio signal frequencies down to baseband. Uh, and to preserve coherence across the Earth between the independent frequency standards. And they're also used as clocks, because you have to time tag the signals coming in at each telescope to much better than an inverse bandwidth. And if you have a gigahertz of bandwidth, for example, that means a nanosecond of timing, which you can easily do with, with these frequency standards. Okay. So, um, Oh yeah, this is an interesting uh, thing here. So let me give you a little physics question, and I don't even know the answers to this, but it's been called the quantum interference parallax, pa paradox. And so if you start with a Young's double slit interferometer optically, and you have a laser light source through two pinholes, and you get an interference pattern on the screen, if you decrease the light source and continue to decrease it until basically your one photon at a time is coming through, over time you'll still build up the same interference pattern. And this has been pretty well understood. And then the question comes about, could you actually tell which slit a photon came through? And because of the uncertainty principle, basically, uh, there's no way of knowing that uh, without destroying, detecting the photon. Okay, so that's been well known for a long time optically. So when very long baseline interferometry came about, people thought about this and said, there's an interesting question here. Uh, if you've tape recorded the signals, and you can do that coherently, you can, the incoming voltage from the telescope, the amplitude and phase information can be recorded. And so now you could take one of those recordings and generate the interference pattern, and take another recording and see if you could find out which telescope the photon came through. Um, and so this has posed uh, a problem. <laughs> And over decades, there have been, I guess, pro many proposed solutions to this problem, none of which I totally buy, actually. <laughs> and it includes the fact that at the beginning, people said, well, you have to use an amplifier to detect the signals, and that's going to destroy the information about the photon coming in. Uh, the other thing is, you'll never get down to essentially photon counting, uh, low photon rates because of the cosmic microwave background supplying photons, lots of them coming in at radio waves. And uh, the reason I brought this up, it, it was reminded recently there's an Astro PH article, and the number's at the bottom if you can read it, I don't know if you can. I, if you ask me later, I'll get it for you. <clears throat> Saying all oh, those explanations are wrong, it's really got to do with the fact that radio interferometers cross-correlate the signals instead of detecting them in a, basically a square law detector, which is a screen optically. So I don't know the answers to these. I just thought this might be interesting for you. So don't, don't ask me to explain it. <laughs> OK, let's go back. And the main question I'm going to ask now with very long baseline interferometry, how accurately can we measure positions on the sky? OK, and I, you know, I could give you a whole talk on this, but it would be kind of dull. I'm going to do it in one slide <laughs> and give you the gist of it. OK, so the fringe spacing or the resolution of a two-element interferometer 
Uh, for the VLBA, at operating at one centimeter wavelength with an 8,000 kilometer baseline is 250 micro arc seconds. Okay, that's a pretty small angle, as you can imagine. Um, okay, if we were, had a bright point source and we want to measure the centroid of it, that's pretty easy to do. Um, and the centroiding precision is basically, basically half times the fringe spacing divided by the signal to noise, very close to that. And so you can see, if you start with 250 micro arc seconds, and you want to get down to 10 micro arc seconds by that formula, you need a signal to noise of about 10 to 15. It's not very hard to do. So if this were all that counted, it would be absolutely trivial to do extremely high uh, precision uh, radio astrometry at the 10 micro arc second level or even below. <coughs> but with astrometry and with interferometry, it always comes down to systematic sources of error. And for any interferometer, systematics depend on path length. Now, I put this sign up here. This is a sign in my neighborhood. And it says West Street, if you can't read it from the back, formerly known as North Road. <coughs> And every time I drove by that, I said, how can this happen? <laughs> That's a 90 degree systematic error. <laughs> um, it only happens in New England. <laughs> OK, so systematic errors in interferometers are basically the path length difference that the light comes in to one antenna versus the other. And so if you have a, even a Young's double slit interferometer, and if you can change the path length of the light coming into one by a wavelength, you'll shift the fringe pattern by one fringe. It's pretty simple. Now, it turns out we can control path length errors uh, with VLBA observations to about two centimeters or so, RMS. And that's about two wavelengths at, at a one centimeter wavelength. Um, The, if, if you can do that, that means we, have, we will have an absolute error of about two fringes in our data. So two fringes is uh, twice that number, so 500 micro arc seconds. And now the question comes if we want to, don't require absolute positional accuracy, but we want to do differential positions. In fact, this was suggested by Galileo in order to do parallax observations a long time ago. A remarkably modern concept from, for Galileo to have thought of this. He basically said, don't try to measure parallax of a star by measuring its right ascension and declination to high accuracy. Take two stars that are nearby. Hopefully, one is bright and nearby, and one is distant and, and is a suitable background source, and measure the differential position. Well, that's what we do. We use background quasars. And the quasars are gen generally at almost infinite distances for us, anything we're concerned about. And we can generally find a background source within about a degree or so of any target we want in the galaxy. And so one degree or so, roughly a hundredth of a, wave uh, of a radian. And so we can cancel um, the... 500 micro arc second position shift will get into a factor of about two hundredths, and that gets us down to about 10 micro arc seconds. So it's making a differential measurement that takes us ultimately from 500 micro arc seconds into the 10 micro arc second range. In order to do this, I mean, this part here, there's a lot of stuff that uh, must go on. Um, you have to keep track of, for example, general relativistic ray bending of light, light around the sun, and you have to do it over the whole sky, because it only falls off as, as the angle from the sun, linearly. Uh, you have to worry about um, precession mutation aberration, of course, to, to uh, very high levels of accuracy. You even have to worry about solid Earth tides. So the telescopes, in fact, the ground we're standing on here, is going up and down twice a day with an amplitude of about 20 centimeters. And so to get down to two centimeters, you have to take into account things like that. OK. Well, let's now go on to the science you can do with this, this sort of accuracy at 10 micro arc seconds. 
So let's first talk about mapping the Milky Way. Um, here's a picture of the Milky Way. Optically, this is, these are the VLT telescopes in, uh, in Chile. And from our vantage point in the Milky Way, we're inside of it. Uh, it's basically a disk. And this is what it looks like across the sky. And you can see all these dark patches here. That's dust absorbing the light from stars. And so basically, optically, you can't even see very far through the Milky Way. You can only see about 10 or 20 percent of the distance from us to the galactic center, generally. <clears throat> so it's a real problem. And in fact, we don't know what the Milky Way looks like. And this is sort of an educated guess. Here are two external galaxies. Uh, this galaxy's got a, a sizable bar and, and two dominant spiral arms. This galaxy is, uh, has a pretty weak bar, if any, and roughly four spiral arms. And if you mashed up the two of these, it's probably something like the Milky Way looks like. But since we can't see through the Milky Way optically and distances are really large, it's very hard to say anything more than that. And that's just an educated guess. Now there was uh, a great um, space project the Europeans put up called the Apar Hipparchos uh, Satellite. It measured, did astrometry, it measured parallaxes or distances to stars um, with one milli arc second accuracy. And that gives you a 10% accurate distance at 100 parsecs. Now 100 parsecs is not very big in terms of galactic scale. This is the 10% error circle for Hipparchos were the sun right here and were this the Milky Way. So you can see you've got to do a lot better than one milli arc second accuracy. Uh, there is a big project, a big, it's another telescope, the successor to Hipparchos that was launched a few years ago and is now trying to me measure distances to one billion stars and their goal is with 20 micro arc second parallaxes and this would be the 10 percent error circle for Gaia. But of course Gaia is an optical telescope in space, it can't look through the dust in the Milky Way so it's got to look out of the plane of the Milky Way. So it's not really going to give us the spiral structure of the Milky Way, at least not directly. It will tell us a lot of other things and will revolutionize a lot of astronomy, but, but not this problem. So with 10 micro arc second positional accuracy that we've done uh, with the very long baseline array, we can sort of get a 10% accurate circle that looks about like that. And so basically what we do is we, if this is the Milky Way again, we find a region of massive star formation uh, usually where there are a lot of molecular masers, which I'll tell you about in a minute. They're really great astrometric targets. Uh, we measure the parallax as the Earth goes around the Sun, and I'll show you that in just a second schematically. And we measure this distance, and then the goal is just to get lots of them and trace out the arms and make a plan view, an architect's plan view of the Milky Way. So that's, that's our, our goal. So, uh, just to orient you about trigonometric parallaxes, also called annual parallax. This is a picture you can get on the web. If this is the sun, and if this is the earth going around the sun once a year, if here's the distance from the sun to a star, or some object you want to measure its parallax, you do, as Galileo said, do it against a background of very distant objects. <coughs> And you can see, of course, you'll get a different viewpoint if you're viewing here in December, you'll view in this direction. If you're viewing in June, you'll view in that direction. You have a triangle here, it's very simple. You measure the parallax angle, you know this leg of the triangle, and you get the distance. To give you some numbers, the nearest stars are at a distance of about one parsec. A parsec is uh, the, the angle subtended by a star uh, the distance of a parsec, if that's one arc second for the angle. So uh, that's just the definition of a parsec. It's about three light years. So the nearest stars have a parallax of about one arc second. The center of the Milky Way is at about 8,000 parsecs. And so it, there's the parallax, 0 0.125, 125 micro arc second parallax. And we can do this stuff, and I'll show you. But uh, nearby galaxies, if you wanted to actually measure a parallax of a nearby galaxy, you're down at about the micro arc second parallax, and, and that's something we can't do at this point. 
So let me show you an, one exam a couple of examples of parallax. Uh, here's the um, in, uh, optical picture of the Orion Nebular Cluster. You can see this maybe with the naked eye at a dark sky site if you have good eyes. With binoculars, you certainly can see it or any small amateur telescope. Uh, it's a region of massive star formation. This is, these are the trapezium stars here. There are four very high mass stars um, that are ionizing the material around them. We observed three fairly low mass stars, also called Titari stars. They're circled here in yellow. This one actually is a distant companion of one of the trapezium stars, but it's on a large enough separation, a long enough period, it doesn't affect the parallax measurement over one year. Okay, we measured the positions of these stars over a year and a half uh, against a background quasar. And here I've plotted the eastward offset versus time, and here's the northward offset versus time. The scale is pretty small now. We're going from tick marks here are two milli arc seconds. The time is a year and a half from here to here. So we measured this, these stars every six months. We actually timed it to when the parallax signature from the Earth's orbit in the east-west direction was maximized. That gives you the, the most bang for the buck in terms of accuracy in measuring a parallax. Always measure the biggest signal you can. Uh, there are three points on there. I don't know if you can see the error bars. They're, they're sort of merged together. They're pretty small. Those are the positions of these three stars uh, relative to a distant quasar. Six months later, they were down here. Six months later, up here. And six months later, down here. I should mention, uh, we've taken out the proper motion, which is astronomical, uh, astronomical jargon for the motion across the sky. Of course, these objects are moving, the sun's moving, uh, so there's always this vector you have to take out. However, if you time your observations uh, in, in Carefully, in, in a certain sequence, you can get a zero correlation coefficient between the proper motion and the parallax parameters. So once you've taken out the proper motion, there's only one parameter that goes into fitting that, since you know the Earth's orbit and you know where the source is. And that gives you the parallax. And you can read it off here. It's just the amplitude of this sinusoid at about 2 milli arc seconds. So the parallax we get, a little over 2, we get 2.4 milli arc seconds with an uncertainty of about 40 micro arc seconds in this case. And that says that the Orion Nebula cluster is at about 414 parsecs with about 2% accuracy. This was actually an important measure for understanding star formation because it, it reduced the distance that was typically used, which was 480 parsecs considerably. And you usually get the square or the cube of that difference if you're estimating mass or luminosity. Um, and that also affects ages of young stars. So it's kind of interesting astrophysically, but I'm not going to go into that in this talk. Uh, so these, I mentioned, were T-Tari stars. They emit gyrosynchrotron radiation from stellar activity on, on the surface with very strong magnetic fields. However, these, thing, these stars are pretty weak. You can do them out to 400 parsecs and maybe a kiloparsec. But if you want to go across the galaxy with current telescopes, you really need to uh, have stronger sources. Oh, yeah, one point. After we measured this, an array in Japan called Vera made the same type of measurements, but not on these stars. Uh, they made it on molecular masers, which I'll talk about in a second, in this region in here, and got almost the same distance with about the same accuracy. So when you get a parallax observation, it's typically quite robust. OK, stronger sources, astrophysical masers. OK, just as a general overview of what they are. OK, uh, you get strong maser emission in lots of molecules at radio wavelengths, uh, well-known ones. There's water, hydroxyl, methyl alcohol, silicon monoxide, and then there's some other molecules like formaldehyde that give you occasion, occasional fairly weak masers. These are the sort of the really strong ones. <coughs> Uh, they're found generally th toward three types of stars. Uh, usually you need a lot of luminosity from a star to end up, uh, the, the radiation from the star m might heat dust and the dust infrared radiation that's re-radiated might pump the masers. 
they're found in star forming regions, which are the ones we'll, we're talking about here. Just to note, they're also found around what are called evolved or red giant stars, very old stars that are very big and very luminous. And they're also found near supermassive black holes at the centers of some galaxies that have accretion disks that you can view edge on. Uh, astrophysical masers are basically one pass amplifiers, no mirrors involved. <laughs> um, it's sort of a planetary like mass, mostly of hydrogen, but trace constituents of these molecules. The sizes of these regions, the amplifier lengths are something like five astronomical units, so like the distance between the Sun to Jupiter. Uh, the hydrogen densities involved are something like 10 to the ninth per cubic centimeter, or if you like different units, 10 to the 15th, 10 to the minus 15th grams per cubic centimeter, or MKS, 10 to the minus 12 kilograms per meter cubed. So these are fairly high densities for, for interstellar conditions. You only really see them where uh, stars are actively forming and a lot of material has come together. And they're generally pumped by collisions and or infrared radiation. And the pumping is pretty complicated for these masers. And by the way, here are some images. I actually made these as a postdoc. This was a long time ago. These are hydroxyl maser images. So here's a piece of the sky, not very big. The tick marks are 50 milli arc seconds here. And here's a very bright spot. So these hydroxyl masers along that line of sight give you almost a laser-like uh, <clears throat> point of light. In other regions, you sort of get a complicated mixture of, uh, of emission spots across the sky. These are the ones, of course, that we'd like to use for astrometry. These, these get a little complicated and aren't as easy to use. So let me just show you one example of a water maser parallax, a fairly distant one. I got three panels to show this. If this is the sky, uh, this is pointing toward the galactic center. Uh, it's a cloud called Sagittarius B2. It's sort of about 100 parsecs from the galactic center, pretty close. Um, it's about a degree away from the galactic center on the sky. We only yeah. know the projection. Uh, Sorry. We only know the projection. We only know the projection fairly. We we have some indications of the line of sight offset from the galactic center from its proper motion and its radial velocity, but there's some ambiguities in that. But we know it's close. Um, the, the detailed answer is this source has a, an, a local standard of rest velocity of about 60 kilometers per second. And toward the galactic center, everything should have zero kilometers per second if it's in nice, smooth, circular orbits. So it's only when you get close to a lot of mass and have a, a significant angular offset, an azimuthal offset, that you get that. Um, Sag B2 water masers. Uh, OK, so here's the sky. Tick marks, uh, major tick marks are one milli arc second. And here's what you see. Uh, here's September 29th, 2006. We measured it up here. Uh, six months later, the, the, thing is, the maser spots have moved. And a year later, they're down here. So they moved about a little over four milli arc seconds. <clears throat> you can see a little bend in there. That's the parallax. Uh, you can plot the east-west offset, which I've done in solid blue here, versus time, um, or the north-south offset versus time in a dashed line. As I said, if you have an observing sequence a as we have here, you get zero correlation coefficients between the parameters. You can remove this proper motion very easily. And this is what's left over. This is the parallax signature in the east-west direction. And we timed it so there would be nothing in the north-south direction. Because you can see these error bars are bigger than those. That's a long story, but uh, we, we know about this. <laughs> there are several factors that go into that. So we, we, we know we can get better east-west measurements, and so we target that. Um, now, the, the scale here is pretty small. From here to here is only one half of a milli arc second, 500 micro arc seconds. And you can read the parallax off here, the semi amplitude here, is about uh, a little over a tenth of a, of a milli arc second. Turns out the parallax, the fit to that data, gives, I don't know if you can read it at the bottom, 129 micro arc seconds with about 10% accuracy. That says that this cloud of gas where stars are forming is at 7.8 kiloparsecs. 
with an uncertainty of about 10%. And in some sense, that's a direct measurement of the distance to the galactic center. Uh, but I'll tell you later that the 10% accuracy is not really in the game these days. We can get down to a couple percent. And I'll show you that. Well, I'll mention it briefly. OK, so we've done lots of water masers across the Milky Way, measured parallaxes. We've done lots of methyl alcohol masers. And here's sort of a schematic view of the Milky Way based on about 100 measurements of parallax distance to uh, stars all across the Milky Way. So let me orient you here. This is the galactic center right here at 0, 0, that star. The sun is up here, the little red sun symbol, about 8 kiloparsecs up. And every spot on here, um, for example, this one right here, that is Sag B2, the one I just showed you the parallax for. So that brought it down 7.8 kiloparsecs, uh, almost toward the galactic center. Uh, the other parallax I showed you was the Orion Nebular Cluster. That's, of course, very near the sun. Let's see if I can hold this steady enough. Here's the sun. That blue dot right next to it is the Orion Nebula Cluster. So we have some nearby and some very distant ones. OK, uh, I hope it's clear we're tracing spiral structure in the Milky Way. Um, one thing I'll point out, but I won't explain very clearly, is the color coding of these dots. So all of these black ones, for example. Uh, we know what spiral arm they are in from information that does not include the distance. So it's basically from their coordinates and their Doppler shift. Uh, we can, you can see spiral structure in what are called galactic longitude velocity plots. You see arcs of stuff. People have known this for a long time. The trouble was you couldn't take those arcs in velocity space and transform to distance very accurately. So the color coding is based has, has little to do, well, did not use the distances. So this is the, what's called the outer spiral arm of the Milky Way, because it's about as far out as there are spiral arms in the Milky Way. This is the Perseus spiral arm. And actually, we have a few sources over here. This is the local, often called the Orion arm, or Orion spur. Then you go inward, the Sagittarius arm, the Scutum arm, and then you get into the center where we've schematically shown what might be a, the galactic bar or bars in the center of the Milky Way. Uh, I don't want to dwell on this, um, just point out a few interesting things. One is that there's this big gap in the Perseus arm. This is thought to be one of the dominant spiral arms in the Milky Way. And we were quite surprised when we found this. Uh, for example, these objects here uh, in the local arm, we originally thought they would be in the Perseus arm out here. So you take a ray from the sun through these things. We thought they'd be more distant but they turned out to be here. And so uh, it, it's not unusual to have spiral arms in other galaxies that have gaps or you know, more, more or less uh, star formation. But uh, it's interesting to know the Perseus arm is in that group. The other interesting thing is the local arm here. Uh, it, it was not given much significance by astronomers. It was thought to be a little spur, a little minor uh, piece of the, of the Milky Way. But you can see, you know, in terms of density of massive star forming regions, and this is not a statistically clean sample, but you can just see that it's comparable to the Perseus arm here. But those points were blue, so why did you think they yeah. were further away? Yeah. Well, those are the ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Fred's asking, you know, I just said we color code them by their longitude, velocity, and latitude. Okay. Turns out these you can't do. Those we had to do by distance. So almost all of them were done by the original by the not using distance. The problem is at almost 90 degrees, uh, this is galactic longitude. You draw a line up from the galactic center through the sun, well, sorry, from the sun through the galactic center, and then the sun to an object, that angle in there, if you could see what I did, <laughs> is the galactic longitude. This is galactic longitude 90 degrees, everything off in this direction. As the Milky Way spins, it's not very bright. As the Milky Way spins clockwise from this view from the North Galactic Pole, uh, if you look out in this direction, you get almost zero relative Doppler shift. Zero. Okay. So there's not much Doppler shift in this, so there wasn't much handle to determine the, uh, which arm it was in. 
I would say 85, 90% of these sources, the color coding was without parallax, but th there were a few in there. There's always some exceptions. Okay. Um, can we make, I mean, our goal is to try to make a, a real three-dimensional model of the Milky Way. So we'd like to actually do more than just the sources that we can measure parallax to do. It takes a bit of time to measure these. Uh, but there are catalogs of star forming regions. I mean, Giles has made many. And we can actually leverage the fact that we sort of know where the spiral arms are fairly accurately. We can take a catalog source that has, say, galactic coordinates and, and LSR velocity, Doppler shift. And if we can match it to what is observed in these spiral arms, for example, in a carbon monoxide emission, then we could say, well, if it matches really well, uh, it's off in this direction here. And if it really matches the carbon monoxide longitude, latitude, velocity of this arm, then you know we know it's over here. So we've written a program to do this. Um, this is filling in the spiral structure of the Milky Way. And as I said, we leverage the, the fact that we now know where spiral arms are in this part of the Milky Way pretty well. Uh, we do combine it with other, other distance information in a Bayesian approach. So for example, we can use kinematic information. Uh, it turns out galactic latitude, how far out of a plane and angle it is, is an indicator of distance. Something that is exactly in the plane of the Milky Way is more likely distant than nearby. Is it, okay, is that clear? You know, if it's got an angular, it's got a linear spread, you know, uh, each spiral arm does. And if the spiral arm's farther away, the, the distribution function is narrower. So anyway, uh, we, we use some other information too, and the idea is to construct what is a realistic and better visualization of the Milky Way. And this we've done using uh, four catalogs of uh, massive star forming region sources. Now you can see over here uh, the dashed red line and these, uh, I guess they look kind of green here. Uh, that's uh, what, uh, those sources can only be really observed from the southern hemisphere. We've done all our observations to date in the northern hemisphere, so we don't know the spiral arm uh, configurations out here. And so all these have been put on using only kinematic information. It shows you how reliable kinematic information is. Obviously when we uh, fill out the rest of the Milky Way, all this spread here will end up concentrated in, in various spiral arms. These arms continue, for example, like that probably. Okay, so we need southern hemisphere observations. So I'm currently going down to Tasmania twice a year to try to set up uh, an array of VL radio telescopes to do VLBI to do this. And we should be about a three-year project once we get it going next year. Okay. Now, uh, this is just kind of fun to see what the Milky Way looks like. It turns out you can do a lot of astrophysics. Um, you can, for example, determine the distance to the galactic center very accurately. You can determine how fast the Milky Way spins, which is a very important parameter for lots of studies. So in a nutshell, what we've done so far is model all that data. And so as we take as independent variables the spatial coordinates, so the two spatial coordinates on the sky and the distance we measure as an independent variable. And then we fit the three components of motion, so the proper motion in the east-west direction, north-south direction, and along the line of sight, the Doppler velocity. And we fit that data. So we have, say, 100 objects. We have 300 data points. OK, the model we're using at the moment is very simple. Uh, you take the, the fundamental parameters are the distance to the galactic center and the rotation speed of the galactic disk near the sun. Um, you also need to know the motion of the sun, the peculiar motion of the sun, that is its non-circular motion as it goes around the Milky Way. It's about 10% of its uh, uh, circular motion. So it's got an ellipticity of about 10%, eccentricity of 10% in its orbit. These we have pretty strong priors on from lots of observations over many decades done by optical and radio astronomers. So just to make a long story short, because I can't spend too much time on this, these are the values we get by fitting these two parameters. 
So the distance to the galactic center we get is 8.34 kiloparsecs with 2% uncertainty. And the rotation speed is 240 kilometers per second, plus or minus about 8. Could I ask a really naive question? Sure. Is it easy to define where the galactic center is if you have trouble mapping all the, all the stars in that region? Um, no, it's, it is easy, yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you in a minute there's a source there that is a supermassive black hole at the dynamical okay. center. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And so we know exactly where it is now. Originally, when astronomers made galactic coordinates in about the 1920s, uh, they had no idea where the galactic center was because you can't see to the center. You could sort of tell it was toward the constellation Sagittarius, sort of, but they just decided to make arbitrary coordinates for the, what's called the galactic longitude because they didn't know. But you know, we know where the galactic center is very accurately. Okay. Um, once we know these values, we can actually generate uh, a lot of galactic kinematic information. Okay, so here's a schematic of the Milky Way, the sun here, sorry, galactic center here, sun here. Here's an object halfway across the Milky Way that's, uh, say, a molecular maser in a massive star forming region. We measure its three dimensional velocity vector uh, from our parallax measurements. Uh, but of course, it's a differential measurement. Uh, it's, it's relative to the sun, and the sun is moving roughly in a circle like that. But now that we know the sun's full motion around the galactic center, we know that to a couple percent, we can add that vector back in, and we get the galact we transform from a heliocentric coordinate system to a galactocentric coordinate system, and we get the galactocentric velocity vector in 3D for that object. So with that, you know, if we measure, if we know its distance, d, from the sun, and if we know the distance to the galactic center, we can calculate the, the galactocentric distance of this thing, and now we can plot, say, the tangential velocity uh, of this object as a function of galactocentric radius, which is called a rotation curve. And this, whoops, I went the wrong way. And this is a rotation curve of the Milky Way. So this is rotation speed of the Milky Way. Uh, tick marks are 50 kilometers per second. So this is 250 kilometers per second here. As a function of distance from the galactic center, going from 0 to about 15 kiloparsecs out here. Okay, And you can see immediately that the rotation curve is very flat. That dashed red line is a pretty good fit to it, if you want to do that. At, at the rotation speed that we um, obtained from fitting all the data. OK, and this is probably, I would say, by far the best rotation curve of the Milky Way that has ever been generated, because it's based on three-dimensional motions, not Doppler shifts only, one-dimensional motions. And it's based on real gold standard distances, the parallaxes. OK, well, that value is about 20 kilometers per second higher than most astronomers have used for the last several decades. And it turns out theta naught, the rotation speed of the Milky Way at the sun, is a critical parameter in estimating, for example, the mass of the Milky Way's components. Uh, so the disk components, which are dominated by stars in the Milky Way, uh, the mass estimate you'd get is basically you know, v squared r over g. And it turns out to give you about 10 to the 11 solar masses. Uh, within about 15 kiloparsecs. Uh, dark matter halos. Uh, galaxies have dark matter halos. The Milky Way is not unusual in that respect. It's a little more complicated. It's, uh, have to have some theory and some simulations of dark matter uh, uh, dynamics. And you get uh, a density distribution for dark matter out of these simulations, which leads to the formula that the mass in dark matter goes as the maximum velocity cubed of, uh, that you see in the, in the rotation curve, divided by 10 times the gravitational constant times Hubble's constant. And if you put in those numbers, you get about 10 to the 12th solar masses for the dark matter halo of the Milky Way. So increasing this by about 10% increases that value by about 30%, about a third. And so we've upped the mass of the Milky Way if this value is correct. There are a lot of interesting other other interesting astrophysical questions that this relates to. Um, so here are just some of them. 
if you increase the, the rotation speed of the Milky Way, you increase its mass and actually the overall size of the dark matter halo. It turns out it decreases the velocity of the Large Magellanic Cloud. That's a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, presumably. And so it helps to bind the local, the Large Magellanic Cloud to the Milky Way in two ways. One is that you've made the Milky Way more massive, and the other you've decreased the, this velocity vector. Um, and also there's another galaxy I'll mention in a minute, uh, the Andromeda Galaxy. By changing theta naught, increasing theta naught increases the likelihood of an Andromeda Milky Way collision in a few billion years. Hopefully I'll have a few minutes to talk about that at the end. Okay, so let me give you one other interesting uh, tidbit about theta naught. If you change theta naught, it affects the um, tests the general relativity of gravitational radiation from the Hulse-Taylor binary pulsar, which got the Nobel Prize in about 1993. So it's a tight uh, binary with a pulsar, and you can measure the pulsar period, and you can see that the period is decreasing, presumably from gravitational radiation. But you need to account for accelerations of the measurement platform, the Sun, or the Earth, and the pulsar as they orbit the galaxy. So there's a v squared over r acceleration as, these, uh, as we and this pulsar go around the galaxy. And it contributes about 1% to the observed period derivative. So you have to account for that. So in 1993, when Hulse and Taylor uh, got the Nobel Prize for this, they were using IAU values for the distance to the galactic center of 8.5 kiloparsecs, a little bigger than we get, with a fairly sizable uncertainty of 1 kiloparsec. They were using a lower rotation speed, theta naught, of 20, 220 kilometers per second. And so if you take the observed period derivative, corrected for the galactic acceleration, and divide by what you expect from general relativity, they got this GR parameter of 0.9994 plus or minus 0 0.0023. Well, if you stick in our new values, you get an interesting result. The uncertainties drop by a factor of three because this was now the largest component in, in the error budget for this measurement. But you'll notice we're several sigma off now. <laughs> OK, now, here's probably why. Uh, they assumed a distance to the pulsar of almost 10 kiloparsecs, based on hydrogen absorption measurements. Uh, if you bring that pulsar into about 7 kiloparsec distance, uh, that would make this number one exactly. So there's a real test here, and people are now trying to measure the distance to the pulsar. And if it turns out to be 10 kiloparsecs, boy, we've got a problem. <laughs> if it turns out to be 7.2, we've made a great prediction. So we'll see what happens with that. Okay, running. Going to measure the distance to the pulsar? Uh, parallax. Trigger, yeah, so I'm leaving that to the pulsar parallax okay. people. It's not an easy measurement. It's a fairly weak pulsar, fairly far away. But it's doable. OK, uh, taking way too long here. So let's go to the center of the Milky Way. Uh, this is an infrared picture of the center of the Milky Way. I've mentioned you can't see the Milky Way's center optically. Um, in fact, if you, this bulge in here is probably the bar at the galactic center. And all the light that's coming from that, uh, bul that bar at the galactic center is extincted uh, totally visually, and in the infrared, about 10% of the light gets to us. But at radio waves, you can see right through the, to the galactic center, and here are two radio images uh, made with the VLA. This is the, the general galactic center region. There's a lot going on in here. This blue stuff is probably uh, a supernova remnant, maybe several. And the uh, brighter stuff in here uh, is mostly thermal emission, um, and here's a blow up. Uh, there's a lot of ionized gases, dust and gas in here. Farad, you could ask him to give you a whole talk on this region. Uh, but here is a point radio source that showed up in the 1970s. Uh, it's called Sagittarius A star. I'm not giving anything away, that's a supermassive black hole right there. OK, well, you've had talks by Andrea Getz a couple of weeks ago. I don't know how many of you saw those talks. About most, OK. Uh, Sagittarius A star. So she showed you this picture, probably. It's about the central uh, arc second of the Milky Way. 
Every, all these blue things, all those are stars. They orbit the black hole. But uh, all they know from the infrared observations is that, for example, this star has made one and a half elliptical orbits over the last 24 years or so. And um, they know that the other stars, which you can see parts of these ellipses, uh, they all have the same gravitational focus right there. So that's, that's one bit of information. And if you know the distance to the galactic center, you can get the mass, and you get four million solar masses for the black hole at the center. But if you want to really you know, go further here, uh, I mentioned in the radio waves we see the black hole. It's a point source. But where, is it, where does it fall on, the, on this image is a, is a question. And if you try to do this with absolute coordinates, it's difficult. The radio and the infrared reference frames are inaccurate at about the couple tenths of an arc second level, or about this level. And so within that error circle, Sagittarius A star could be any one of these objects here, or none. So how do you solve that problem? Uh, basically, you have to find sources that are visible both in the radio and the infrared. And there are red giant stars that have silicon monoxide masers in their atmospheres. And all the stars that are circled here are red giants where they have these masers. We can measure their positions with the VLA, for example, or the Very Long Baseline Array relative to Sagittarius A star. So we get milli-arc second sort of accuracy. And we can also see them move. And there they are. And so we know Sag A tar star is at the center of that circle um, on this image. This background image is an infrared image. OK, so what you do is you take this grid of stars from the radio. We know, we know, we know where they are relative to Sag A star on the radio. We use them to calibrate the infrared frames. We calibrate the, what's called the plate scale and the plate rotation. And then you translate them and line them up. And you know exactly where Sag A star is on the infrared images. Um, what just happened? Oh. I've gone through this. OK, one thing we've, yes. So when you do that, you find that Sag A star's position is, is coincident with the gravitational focus of the orbits. So the infrared people know where the focus is. We can tell them that, that Sag A star is exactly at the position of the gravitational focus to about a milli arc second or eight astronomical units. So where is it? Here's a blow up of an infrared image. Uh, there are three stars, S1, S2, S3 here. And where is Sagittarius A star? It's right there at the edge of the seeing disk of, of, of star S3. It's basically invisible. At least it's much dimmer than uh, almost any of these stars here, which is kind of astounding and sort of tells you it's probably got an event horizon. Otherwise, that wouldn't happen. OK, well. If Sag A star is a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way, it should, be, it should anchor the center of the Milky Way. It should basically not move much. OK, so I started a project about 20 years ago uh, to measure the position of Sag A star. I was trying to measure the parallax, which is hard to do. But the proper motion of Sag A star is really easy. It builds with time. So here's a schematic. Here's the galactic center, Sag A star. Here's the black hole. Here's the sun. You know, we wait a bit, and the sun goes around the Milky Way. <laughs> it takes about 200 million years to go around it. And you make a, a measurement at a different position. You get essentially a parallax-like uh, offset of Sag A star relative to some background quasars. Here's a radio image of the sky. Here are two background quasars that have nothing to do with the Milky Way. And what we expect from the sun going around the Milky Way is Sag A star should drift downward to the lower right at about 6 milli arc seconds per year. So here's the data um, starting in 1995. So this is the sky. So north upward, east to the left. Uh, major tick marks are 20 milli arc seconds. We started measuring it about yearly. As you can see, it's marching down to the lower right, as I said it should. You can see it's about 6 milli arc seconds per year. Uh, we started spacing the observations out 2003, 2007, 2013. Okay, the red dashed line is a, a weighted least square fit to that data. You can see it's a pretty good fit. And the blue line is the orientation of the galactic plane. And so you can see they, 
they aren't quite the same. And what that's caused by is that the sun is moving upward out of toward the North Galactic Pole at about uh, 8 kilometers per second or so. Actually, we measure 9. So that's the difference between those two lines. Um, you can, if you take out the sun's motion, uh, basically you can say that Sagittarius A star's real motion, intrinsic motion, is less than about a kilometer per second. It's in that ballpark. There are stars near Sag A that move at 5,000 kilometers per second. So the only way this object could be sitting there and not moving, it's got to be very massive. So how do we quantify that? Oh, by the way, I just always like to say this. If you look, for example, even this is observations over a few weeks in there, about a month, you can see you could actually detect this slope in a few weeks with a very long baseline array. It's a 200 million year orbit. You can actually measure that in a few weeks. It's kind of, I, I think it's kind of neat. Okay. How do we get a, a bound, a lower bound? Whoa, what's that doing over there? Okay. Things are slowing down. Too many dots on this. Okay. Uh, what we have is basically a uh, gravitational Brownian motion problem, and Fred can tell you all about this. <laughs> um, this bothered me for a long time, a little side story. I was really worried. Fred, Fred was always saying that when you have a gravitational Brownian motion problem, uh, things come into thermal equilibrium, and so the heavy object moves slower and the lighter objects move fast, and it's equipartition of kinetic energy between the massive object and, the, and a typical star. I always was worried, yeah, well, the solar system, you know, that doesn't happen, <laughs> right? It's, just, it's equipartition of momentum in the solar system. This bothered me for a long time. And so finally, uh, found out you can show that uh, you can actually show that if you transition from a small number of objects to a large number of, of perturbing objects, that sort of where their sum of their mass is equal to the uh, black hole, then you get this Brownian motion problem, and Fred was right and I was wrong. And so uh, I had to pay off on a bet on that one. OK, so just to give you an idea of what the masses are, um, if you use the gravitational Brownian motion, you put in round numbers. Sag A star is moving at less than about a kilometer per second for that. Put in one solar mass for a star, and the typical speed of stars moving around Sag A star, a little further out, of about 300 kilometers per second you get that the mass has to be greater than about 10 to the fifth solar masses. And if you do detailed simulations, which we've done, uh, you get that the mass has to be greater than about 4 times 10 to the fifth solar masses. That's about 10% of the mass that's seen gravitationally. So at least 10% of the mass that's seen gravitationally is tied to the radiative source we see. Probably all of it, but, but that's all we can say with this limit. If yeah, we'd expect about three-tenths of a kilometer per second jiggling Brownian motion of the supermassive black hole. Okay. Um, you can actually try to measure the size of Sag A star in the radio, and there's a big effort called the Event Horizon Telescope uh, to measure that size. If you use Earth baselines and you go to very sh short radio wavelengths of about one millimeter, you get an angular resolution of about 20 micro arc seconds. Uh, Short shield radius is, is about 10 micro arc seconds for this black hole. Um, here is some early data from uh, Vent Horizon Telescope. So this is interferometer signal or flux density versus baseline length separation of the antennas. And you can model that. There are data points here with short spacings, data points with long spacings. And they, it's not unique. You could fit a Gaussian brightness distribution to that, or you could fit a ring. And the ring goes like this. You may not be able to see it. Either one will work. The scales you get are sort of 30, 40 uh, micro arc seconds for the source. Here's a gravitational ray tracing model that would, would give you this signature. And it shows you basically the extreme Doppler boosting you get as material comes from the back to the front uh, at the speed of light almost. Um, at the, this is the light. This is the shadow of the black hole. I guess we'll hear about this later, right? OK. <laughs> OK. So size is about, uh, well, let's say, 50 milli micro arc seconds. And now you can put together a little table. And then I'm going to quit at that point, last view graph. Um, 
the density limits for supermassive black hole candidates. Let's start with a globular cluster. That's really, um, you know, we know it's not black holes. It's a collection of something like 100,000 stars within a radius of about a parsec, or 2 times 10 to the fifth astronomical units. You can get two densities out of it. Uh, the real physical density is 2 times 10 to the fourth solar masses per cubic parsec. So, you know, it's like putting uh, 2 times 10 to the fourth stars between us and the nearest star. It'd be, be a lot of them. And there's m over r is a more, perhaps a more interesting number for uh, um, strong gravity because the Schwarzschild radius is 2, 2 g m over c squared. So m over r is 2 g over c squared. And you get 7 times 10 to the 18th in, in uh, mks units. OK. Uh, the galactic center stellar orbits, the type of stuff that Andrea talked about, uh, just to go to this number, give greater than about almost 10 to the 16th solar masses per cubic parsec, which rules out almost anything but a black hole. Uh, but it's still about a factor of eight orders of magnitude from a real supermassive black hole within a sh uh, several Schwarzschild radii. That would be the density of. OK, but if we take the limits we get from Sag A star's proper motion, that it's more than 10% of the gravitational mass, and we take the event horizon telescope measurements of the size, a couple tenths of an astronomical unit, put the two together, assuming the real size, um, the apparent size, is bigger or, than, or equal to the real size, uh, you get a density of about 10 to the 23 solar masses per cubic parsec within an order of magnitude of basically the ultimate limit for a black hole. OK, I was going to talk about extragalactic motions, but I'm running way over. And so I think I will stop there. If you want, you can ask me about them. But <laughs> um, I think that's about all. Okay, gap in the Perseus arm. Um, if you, would it be possible that there's just something obscuring it? In no. Way from that um, angle? Yeah, okay. There's, there's some something in here that's killing my computer. <laughs> okay, here we go. Ah, oh, I should have gone out. Well, there. Okay, so the question is. Could this gap not be real, caused by extinction? So at radio waves, there's no extinction issue at all. It turns out if you look at other star-forming tracers, uh, you look at infrared emission from <coughs> dust, or if you look at molecular emission surveys, carbon monoxide especially, you actually see that there, it's a lot, you get a lot stronger signal here, and then it weakens considerably here, and then it gets stronger again down here. And in fact, that's what we sort of see here, but not quite. So now we've used catalogs of radio sources and put them in the context of the spiral arms. And if there were a lot of things in this region here, this is that gap in the Perseus arm, they would show up here. And you can see we filled in a little bit here. So the gap is biggest up here. We had the gap going down to about here. So yeah, there's some you know, subtleties here, but there is a big gap in star formation, in massive star formation there. <clears throat> I have a quick question. So do you ever worry about the uh, phase errors of uh, masers that you're looking at? Because you're, you're assuming that all these masers are yeah, really source. physically moving. Oh, oh. And they, you know, it's yeah. not due to on and off. The basic, some of these masers certainly should go up and down in their amplitudes yeah. and has nothing to do with the motion. Uh, so were you, were you OK, were so, so here, this is a question you, you get asked a lot if you study masers. Well, it could be all sorts of phase effects, and you're not really measuring motions. Um, I've been doing this uh, since 1973. <laughs> uh, I studied lots of masers. And every observation and every indication of motion is that where there re really are clouds of gas that are really moving. Um, some examples, we measured some water masers a long time ago in star-forming regions. And they will change flux density. So the amplification process, they can, you know, they have like 20 gain lengths and exponential e-folds in their, in their flux density. 
Um, if you change conditions by 5%, that's an e-fold, an e-folding change of factor of almost 3. So we see that. We see flux going up and down sometimes. But we actually saw some where the flux went up and then went away, went down. We couldn't detect it. And then we're, we measured positions. So we made a plot on the sky of where it would be. And then a couple of years later, we could find it again as it came back up. <laughs> so that sort of makes it almost impossible to be phase effects. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, no, no. I've, I've had that question asked many times. <laughs> Uh, if they were phase effects, we'd get everything wrong, by the way. So. We have a um, question in the back here. Yeah. It's probably a very stupid question from a neophysicist. Why are you calling this major? I don't really understand what, how coherent the animation is. Ah, OK, yeah. That's, That's a good question. So why do we call these things masers? Uh, well, the, there is a population inversion, and there is an amplification going on. Uh, it's not you know, as coherent as this thing. <laughs> The coherence length is only a matter of, of meters, maybe a kilometer, probably meters at most, in the source. So it's a bunch of, of coherent, coherent blobs that add up incoherently. But it makes generally a nice nearly point source of emission. So for our intents and purposes, it's coherent enough. Yeah. I mean, for, for example, we get Gaussian voltages from masers. So if you actually measure the voltage you receive at the telescope and measure its distribution, we've tried to do this, you need a strong maser to do that. Uh, you, you can see you plot the distribution of vo voltages perfectly Gaussian. So that's a sum of a lot of, it's a Gaussian, it's a sum of a lot of possibly coherent processes over small scales, but it's sort of central limit theorem says that you, you get a, a Gaussian signal at the end. Okay, great. Well, if there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker one more time.